All right. Well, blessings in Jesus once again. Hope the lunch was tasty. We're continuing. You know, some people, if they look on the internet or whatever, oh, well, you know, Moriel, that's the Jacob Pratt. She's into that messianic stuff, <laughs> Hebrew root stuff. And other people, they say, oh, well, you know, he's into that discernment stuff. Going after people who are heretics and teaching error, that's what he does. Different people have a reputation, and I've got a terrible one. <laughs> the only thing is it's diverse. Different people dislike me for different reasons. <laughs> My wife would generally agree with all of them. <laughs> Nonetheless, here we are. But actually, most of what Muriel does, certainly the biggest portion of our budget, annual budget, is missions and evangelism, particularly in the third world. Take care of rubbish dump kids in the Philippines. Dave Boyle was pioneered the work in Africa, but now we're involved in Uganda, and we desperately need missionaries for Uganda. Please pray for us, for the AIDS kids. Big work. 40, 50 kids, and we need missionaries for Uganda. Um, Thailand, you know, Scott Noble does a great work. He leads a great work, taking mission teams into northern Thailand, into his base in Thailand, Royal Thailand. But we go into Burma, to the Golden Triangle. We go up into Laos, um, and basically mission, missionaries to the Buddhists. And we've had Buddhist monks get saved. Um, the Lord has been very gracious to us. And we do other stuff that we don't talk about much for obvious reasons in China and Vietnam and so forth. But we're pioneering, by God's help, a new work in India. A lot of people in India. India is the now the most populous country in the world, just about overtaking China. India has the biggest middle class in the world, over 300 million people. In the middle class. They can't hear me, boy. <laughs> if you can't hear me, you ought to learn how to read lips. <laughs> we had some guy from a church once called my house, got my number, talked to my wife. And he actually said, can we pay your husband to come and speak? And Pavia said, I'd pay him to shut up. And she hung up the phone. <laughs> yep, it's a fact. She's uh, superior to me in many ways. She's a brilliant mathematician who can't balance a checkbook. <laughs> My previous girlfriends called me things like sweetie and honey. She calls me a gamenerink in Yiddish. I don't want to tell you what that means. <laughs> and to make matters worse, she can beat me in mud wrestling. Nonetheless, I'd marry the same woman tomorrow because nobody else would have me. <laughs> Not sure she'd make the same mistake. <laughs> I'll go back to India. The most populous country in the world. Largest middle class in the world. The biggest English-speaking country in the world. More scientists and engineers per capita than any other country in the world. Second biggest media after Hollywood in the world. They call it Bollywood. All of these things. Huge middle class educated population, particularly in technology and the sciences, STEM, and uh, English speaking, the biggest democracy in the world, sort of. <laughs> Yet, it's impoverished. Its economy is one-fifth the size of China's. And it's not going to get better because of Hinduism 
Islam and Sikhism and because of the caste system. It doesn't matter how intelligent and educated Indian people are, and they are, and how many scientists and engineers, and they've got them. You pick up a telephone, you got a problem with your computer, it's going to be somebody in Bangalore telling you how to fix it. They speak English. You'd think that this country would overtake China the way China overtook Japan as the dominant economy in Asia. You'd think so. There's no reason it shouldn't except one. Demonic religions. Uh, yet, despite that, and despite persecution, people don't know that there is persecution from the BJP in India. I was there. They burned this family of Australian missionaries in a car. I was there when it happened. Uh, the churches are growing. Pastors are generally doctrinally ignorant. And because of the caste system, poverty is not seen as a problem. It's seen as karma. To see a little kid hungry, that's okay. That's his karma. It's because of what he did in a previous life. The life of, you know, if you're a good Hindu, you'll come back as a Brahmin, the top of the caste system. But if you're a really good Hindu, you'll come back as a cow. It's unbelievable. I went up to the Taj Mahal, there were people cupping their hands to catch cow urine because they thought it, think it's holy. I was shown photographs of a sect of cannibals, Hinduistic cannibals, on the Ganges. They were fishing dead bodies out of the Ganges and eating them raw. Didn't even cook. Um, it's unbelievable. How such a big country with so much potential has no potential. Look at Indians here. They'll get a little shop. They'll work 18 hours a day, seven days a week to get their kids through university. <laughs> Engineering, medicine, law, computer science, mathematics. Not dumb kids. They're smart kids. How can such intelligent people come from a place that's so backward? Well, it's hard to understand and it's hard to explain. But we do believe the Lord has called us to begin a work. There's been a pastor affiliated with Moria for some time from England who has a heart for India, has spent a lot of time and lived there. And they are helping to establish Moria India. We're going to begin with an orphanage and training Indian pastors. It's a big work. It's a big project. We need prayers. The Lord will provide the money. But obviously it takes money. But above all, it takes prayers and faith and a lot of patience. <laughs> the bureaucracy, look, I've seen third world bureaucracy and corruption in Africa and places like this. India, there's nowhere worse. There is nowhere worse. And I've, I've seen, I mean, we've rescued kids out of the rubbish dumps in the Philippines. You know, we take, <laughs> I've seen real poverty. I've seen terrible things. But India is quite a challenge. It's maybe the biggest challenge our ministry, Moriel, has ever taken on after trying to tell the Jews about their own Messiah. <laughs> Be that as it may, please welcome a dear friend and brother, Pastor Mark Jackson. Praise the Lord. Just one minute. Okay. Is that okay? Right. Brilliant. Well, thanks for that introduction. It's uh, always nice to be amongst friends. And I'll call you friends for now because half an hour later, who knows? <laughs> India, 15 years now, 31 times. I've seen it all. I've done it all. I've been involved with it all. I've started it all. I've been chased here, I've been chased there, I've been chased out of India. But I wouldn't have it any other way. Now, before I get started, if you don't know me, my name's Mark Jackson. I'm from Manchester, you can tell the accent. Yeah? Those Northerners stand together, we're very strong. So don't mess with me and Beryl. And I came, I came to Christ at age 29 in, on the 8th of August, 1989. That makes me 42 today. 
when you think about it, okay? Yeah? And when I became a Christian, not long after, I had a real com compulsion for India. All right? Now, missionaries, uh, it's, a, it's a word that doesn't mean much these days. But if I'm all honest, I, I wanted the, the rarity of mission. I wanted to get in, involved with areas where there was no Christians, no Christian witness, no missionaries, nothing. And I had nothing to offer. I, I didn't even know the Bible at that time. Perhaps I still don't. But I know one thing. I know God loves people, and God loves a, a faithful man or woman who will just step up to the plate and have a go. And God will take over. Uh, you've got to be mad, which I probably am, bad, and just plain daft to do the things that I've done. And I've done it not really thinking. Just gone in, because I, I, I made a promise to the Lord. I'd preach wherever an opportunity was. It would be available. In 2008, I was going to go the following day to a place called Orissa. Uh, we had tickets. On the same night, my friend who was taking me in there got seriously ill. We couldn't make it. In 2008, the great persecution hit Orissa. And many pastors were killed. Over a thousand homes were burnt down. And just as well, I hadn't gone there because I would probably be amongst those statistics, in all honesty. So you've got to believe that God's in it somewhere regardless of how difficult the tasks can be. So, by way of an introduction, and I need to get this on there. Okay. No. Nope. Thank you. <laughs> by way of an introduction, India is all about mission to me. Not about the challenges, because challenges will come, believe me. And it will try your patience, and you will, you will suffer many things, and you will face Many hardships, not perhaps with me, but the people that you come into contact with. And it's heartbreaking at times, it really is. Nevertheless, in all honesty, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people have heard the gospel through Mission Asia Ministries and Morial Ministries. We are introducing this ministry, this teaching ministry, to the pastors because it's needed so so much today. It's, I've avoided pastors' conferences. I have avoided church preaching. I have avoided this for many years because I go for souls. Souls. That's all I want to do. Church planting missions is what I do. However, it's become so ridiculous now, the current climate in Christianity in India. It's embarrassing. And if you was to go on YouTube and just put fake Christians in India, you'd sit there red-faced. You really would. How embarrassing it is. And in fact, so much work that we've done over the last 15 years now has been wiped out because we'll be made to look ridiculous because of these snowflakes, fakes, who've stood up and pretend to be super anointed and have some great gifts and people are falling for it only to be let down when no healing has taken place or no blessings has taken place. It's gone very bad. And with Jacob coming on board now, it's a real, if I may say it, it's a God's end to have such a man and a ministry, because I will use it to the max with all respect and passion for the, for the lost souls. I'll drain it as much as I can with all respect. All right, and this is why we need, it's over a billion people. It ain't going to cost five pounds. It's going to cost a lot of investment, a lot of time and money to reach out and reach as many people as we can. And we need as many people on board to, to do this, to see this vision uh, take root, take place and change people. All right, the one in the middle is the church plant that I do. You'll see that uh, what has become about 10 years ago or something. That's completely changed now. We were in a complete area with no Christians. Within a matter of months, we got 25. Now we have over 150 in that one church. And I'll show you later where that church has become. Morial Ministries, of course, Mission Asia Ministries, at this moment in time, are working together as a partnership. Perhaps Morial would take the initiative and take the lead. <laughs>
That was the last meeting they did in September in the Punjab, 48 degrees. We took the church, we took it outside. Uh, loudspeakers, that's the last meeting they did because the following night I got chased out of the Punjab. My CID were after me for preaching the gospel. I was reported to them by the flakes, snowflakes, because I was preaching the truth. Uh, September, in July, I was there preaching and I, got, I came to preach against this preacher who was giving out for, for money spiritual tablets. Um, if you want it, um, blessings, you give me a thousand rupees or something, I will pray for you and God will give you the blessings. Cars, health, whatever. This man was selling spiritual tablets. So for a whole hour, I berated that concept and I caused such a, an uproar that it's gone all over the Punjab now that I, I'm a, a person that's not to be tolerated. So it's only a matter of time before we come face to face with this lot and we'll have a a little bit of a rundown, <laughs> once and for all. And I've always said, the two or three who come first, they'll just be as sore as me in the morning. <laughs> we have all respect for that. I'll go down, I will go down, but um, he's going to work for it. Amen? So pray that I'll get there next, next February, whenever, God willing, and I can stir up the nest once more. All right. We had the privilege of taking Mr. Jacob Prash to India on, wrong one. <laughs> the church here is the church that, what you saw at the very beginning. These are some of the church plants that I've started. The one there on the left with the kids and the people, that was in Raikia in Orissa. I'm the only missionary working in Raikia. That's the most, pers that's the very place, this same village, 50 pastors were killed in 2008. I'm the only missionary working there. This is a thriving church, and everybody who says they're working in Arissa, they were telling lies. I was the only person working, I was the only person mad enough and daft enough to go. But look at the work. God is doing some great things in amongst the people of Arissa. For many years now, I've avoided the pastor's conference, but now we're taking it on, uh, uh, taking it on head on. We're going to challenge the, 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 the corruption and the falsehoods, and we're going to preach the truth, which you all are here today hearing and learning. They need it there and they need to be challenged in the mindsets and the fakes need to be challenged and taken to task over it. I'm getting older, I'm 57, my days are rolling around in the dirt, three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, hopefully they're coming to an end as we can train up a younger generation who will go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many years overdue, I have been asking Jacob for five years if minimum, to come. But a few you know, circumstances weren't allowing it. But this year, finally. And now that we're there, hopefully it's going to be a yearly occurrence. Please pray for this. The books and the preaching materials of Moriel. I, I, yes, please. I'll have it digitalized. I'll have it all. And we'll spread it out far and wide of India, Nepal, and Myanmar because those are the three countries that I'm in, and Sri Lanka, so it's four, four countries. I've only got half an hour. No, you can stretch it. Thank you. <laughs> Some shots there of a pastor's conference that we did. We, we initially said 100 pastors, 150 turned up on the day. Can't say no. 
<laughs> I've been there 15 years, I can't do that. One session, he does it. But I, I had promoted and, and told him that this, you need to come. I just think the picture at the top is very intimate. I, I like that photograph. A young girl being prayed for on her birthday. And we get honoured wherever we go. This is the Indian tradition. Flowers over you, a shawl uh, given to you as a gift. But the preaching there, challenging and shaping up the pastors with the truth is the most important thing because they will take that out and tell other people. Not all, but most of them. Taj Mahal, been there three times. I'm not going again. <laughs> it's good the first time. Second time's okay. Third time's a little bit draining. But the good thing about this, I got offered a wife. <laughs> <laughs> I said no. <laughs> All right. Jacob said we're, we're looking at a Moriel orphanage. With Samuel there in the middle, obviously. <laughs> the, the, the one side and Jacob on the other. This building is, is available. We're looking at it in all serious, seriousness with the possibility of, it looks small there, but it's bigger than what it looks, with the possibility of, of developing this for the Moriel Orphanage in India, in a place called Kotapetta, which is in Rajamundri in Andhra Pradesh. It's a coconut area, it's a, it's a nice area, and it's a safe area to get kids to come and feel safe and be safe where we can develop a good education, good Christian upbringing, and, and so forth and so on, that they won't otherwise uh, receive. So please pray, because we're looking at this, and we're, we're at the, the, the moment in time of making a decision. But another, another building has just become available, which probably will be a little bit better. So pray, pray for the Lord's leading and guidance, and that we can do this quite speedily. Not that we dragged out, because India is something that, why do it today when you can do it tomorrow? You know, unless it can be going on and on and on, and people don't do nothing. How it's got where it is, I have no idea. But we're looking at a real orphanage, of, of the orphanage rather, and a pastor's um, conference speaking ministry, and to basically get in there and speak to as many people as we can. All right. I spoke to the Lord, said, what can I offer India? He said, just give them the blood and guts gospel. What we mean is this. The gospel is his own power. The gospel will open doors. The gospel will do it, what it does. No gimmicks, no tricks, nothing. Just get out on the streets and preach it in its purity and its rawness. I preached in front of thousands and I preached in to one-on-ones. I preached to uh, drug addicts, to alcoholics. I've seen vast amount of people coming to the Lord and vast amount of lives changed by calling them out. If somebody's a thief, you call them a thief. If someone's a drunk, call them a drunkard. If someone's a uh, drug addict, then just call him a dirty skank. I've done it and I've seen people's lives radically transformed because they said, Pastor, you've upset us. And I said, praise the Lord. Good. I said, what's it done for you? He said, it makes me realize that nobody cares. That the only person who can change me now is Jesus and the hard work and time. Literally, I've seen hundreds coming to the Lord this way. I got in a village preaching once, first time. Hundreds, the whole village came out. At the end of it, a little old lady came up to me with her son. Son was 25. He was a drunkard. I said, tell him off, pastor. He won't listen to me. And so for about five minutes, ten minutes, I berated him, the veins popping out and everything, and shouting at him. He didn't touch any alcohol from that day onwards. He's actually an elder in a church now. Wow. Do you understand? When you can wrap something up, you change the whole dynamics, but when you preach it as it is, it's the power of God unto salvation. Okay, simple as. And there's some shots. This village here was a pure Sikh village and, and few Hindus. I got in because the Sikh elders let me in. It's the very first time they've heard the gospel. Never heard it before. We had a great turnout. We had a great um, amount of people coming to the Lord. We got about 60 in a church there, a house church at the moment. There was 400 plus on the day. These are the Sikh leaderships here. These are the people that let me in. There's a few more of them. If it hadn't been for their permission, it would never have happened. Just by being bold and asking. In fact, one of the Sikhs gave me his sword. That's true conversion because that's his soul. 
Do you know that's, that's the, the, the fruits of the ministry? That's what Jacob was telling you before. These flesh cannibals, agora, agori sadus. That's one of them. I've spoke with them. I've been where with, where with them. I went specifically on my own to talk with some of these agoris. They're a bit mad. This guy was about seven foot when he stood up. <laughs> Do you know where he was? He was living and sitting in, in a place of burning in Orissa, one of the graveyards. They eat, they eat the flesh of dead bodies. But does not he need to hear the gospel as well? All it takes is a little bit of courage, a little bit of stand up, and somebody to go there and face it head on. What, what's he going, what going to do to me? What? Is he going to, he's going to eat me? Is he going to eat me? Well, I'll be dead. So it doesn't really matter. But these ladies here, that's a 4 a.m. prayer meeting in Orissa. They're frightened stiff because of the persecution. But it's the women. Where's the men? Spineless as normal. Where? Where are they? 4 a.m. in the morning. It's a pastor and it's myself. And that was it. The rest was women praying for the people of Orissa. This is the lady with the tattoos in the earring. Uh, the ear, that's when they get married in Orissa. That's their sign of being married. So ladies, you, you imagine if you're born in Orissa, your face gets tattooed and everything. But the young girls now who, who are turning to Christ, they no longer do that. They wear a wedding ring. I think they look a lot better, to be honest. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm in Burma, Myanmar. I won't tell you his name, but this is a small little pastor, a small little home, little bamboo church that we've, we've just started about a year ago, if, if that. Uh, I need to talk to Jacob about this. What we're going to do with it, I have no idea, but this is the pastor and his wife, small group of orphans, and a small group, I don't know, 20, 25 people in that church in Myanmar. Uh, it's another work that we're, we're doing there. This is the Nepal group. This is Pastor Ramesh. Pastor Ramesh Limbo is as hard as nails. Think about it, he's big. He's an Indian from Darjeeling. He went into Nepal 15 years ago. That's the church there. It looks nice, but the thing's falling to pieces. We, we own that land now. We need to take that down and rebuild the church in that area. There's only about 30, 35 people. Uh, where it is, people need to go off um, either to India or into uh, Kathmandu to try and find some work because we're on the border of India. It's a very poverty-stricken area, so the church doesn't seem to grow. But we, we still reach out. There's still a lot of people there that we can, what we do, make contact with. So this is the Nepal branch of the ministry that we're, we're doing together. And very to tie things up, contact, contact Moriel. I have got a blog primarily for the Indian pastors to bounce from. Uh, if you want to log on to that, you can do. And I'll just direct your calls, your emails to Moriel anyway. But get involved with us. Uh, pray for us. Get behind the mission. It is really right in your face ministry. Uh, look, I'm disappointed being here, if I'm honest. I'd sooner be in India. And the reason why I can't go, because it's pocketless again, because I spend it all there. And I build the churches. And I will give out the money to all the people that are in need. Believe me, I, I have nothing for myself. I don't care. I'm not interested. I've not got a pension. I've not got a job. I've got nothing. I work with the untouchables because I'm pretty much an untouchable myself. <laughs> Nobody wants to take me on. <laughs> Can't get a job in a church, pastoring or anything. I'm too straight. And that's the way it is. But it works in, in these areas. It works with these people. But those are the contacts. Uh, I hope I've just in the little time that I have, give you a wide range of what I kind of do in India, Nepal, Myanmar, and Sri Lanka. I had a church in Sri Lanka. We were building it. The Hindus came, ripped it, to, ripped it down, destroyed it. Uh, the government officials now told us that we can no longer have a church in that area. So we, it's a dead, dead work, which was a shame because it was really moving. But, you know, you, you can't get past the governments. No, I don't want to cause problems for people. I'm only there and I'm gone. They have to live there. But mission for India is going to be very challenging. It's going to take commitment, time, prayer, 
finance. Please get involved. Get involved with us. Let us do these works. Let us change people's lives. Let us change children's lives. And let's get the gospel out there for the salvation of the 1.2 billion people. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Mark is a radical evangelist. So Mark has the evangelistic side and we have the teaching side. Not that he doesn't teach, not that I don't evangelize. But you need both. Again, the opportunities in India, because of its size, are incredible. When you are born into a caste system that gives you no hope, and you're told that there is a monotheistic faith with one God that gives you an eternal hope, this draws people. But there are people with a vested interest in perpetuating the caste system. They're the Brahmins who are the senior, the priestly caste at the top. And they get angry when the people who are outcasts, the lowest people, leave Hinduism because they've lost basically what amounts to, in rural India, almost a slave population. There are things that happen in India with the caste system you couldn't believe. But because of the idolatry and superstition, it happens. I read a book by a believer from Goa, formerly Portuguese, who wrote about the Dalit, the outcasts, and the things they were enduring. Not just the economic exploitation, but the oppression they were getting from the Brahmins. Things that were, were, were like shocking to me. Things that I, I couldn't believe. But because the people believed it, they would do it. The power that gurus have over people is unbelievable. I don't know how quite to explain this, but th there's really gross stuff that happens. Um, and, and this, and I won't go into it because it's too gross, but you understand what's happening. You see something similar in Africa with the witch doctors. The pastor becomes the sagorma or the witch doctor, you understand. And the witch doctors sell muti. They sell charms and things to people. And then this gets into the church. So Mara Sorello sells his Holy Ghost miracle cloths to Afro-Caribbean Christians to take away debt for $40, for 25 pounds. This is what happens. They just imitate the pagan cultures of the people and exploit it. Well, in India, it's the same thing. There's a phenomena of the pastors becoming gurus. In Hinduism, it's acceptable for a guru, or for a Brahmin, to be wealthy while the people are impoverished. It's acceptable. Socially, culturally, it's expected. This mentality gets into the church. You understand? It's all right for the pastor to do it. Um, becoming a Christian and becoming a Christian pastor becomes a shortcut to being a guru. <laughs> you don't have to be born a Brahmin. You can be born again and become the same thing. This is really unfortunate. I saw this the first time when I went to India in, in Mumbai, in Bombay. Um, the culture and the religious superstition lends itself to it. Now, <clears throat> the New Testament speaks about this, but most Christians don't understand it in, in Corinthians. For instance, in the Peloponnese, where Corinth is, the Peloponnese is the area of Greece between Italy and Athens. It's where Sparta was, where Corinth was. It's where uh, the Delphic Oracle was at Delphi. The Delphic Oracle would sit over a sulfur pit, inhale the fumes from the sulfur pit, and begin to hallucinate. And she would kind of yodel and have automatic speech. And then the priests of Delphi would interpret her speech. You understand? People saved out of that began bringing that mentality into the church with tongues. You understand? 
they they took a pagan model of tongues and brought it into the church. This kind of syncretism is a big problem. It was a problem in Corinth, it's a problem in Africa, and it's a huge, huge problem in India. The need for teaching these pastors that they're to be servants, not gurus, to change their mentality. Now, only the Lord can change their hearts. But we have to change their wrong understanding. We need to do more pastor seminars in India. And as always, our heart is for these impoverished children, these dollar children. The first time I wanted to do something, I was unable to because of health reasons. It was after the tsunami, when the tsunami hit India. Moriel, Australia, we have a branch in Australia, was supporting an orphanage uh, down in so South East India where the tsunami hit. And when the aid was getting there, the Brahmins were taking all the aid. It was expected that the Brahmins would get the food and whatever, medical supplies. The Dalit and the Dalit children got nothing because they were from the outcasts. This is what you're dealing with. It's totally demonic. Now, I'll tell you, I don't want to go into this now, but when I come to Britain or America or Australia and I see people going to yoga or even see churches doing yoga, they have no idea what this even is or where it comes from. Go see what it really is. Mark has been helping us to get Moriel going in India. He has the experience there we don't have. We'd like, obviously, to get more indigenous Indians involved, like we have in the Philippines. In the third world, it's not always easy to get local indigenous people groomed up, but that becomes the goal. Um, but it's uh, a, a major challenge. Your prayers are much appreciated for Moriel India and for the ministry of Mark, which is almost synonymous with Moriel India now. Uh, again, there are certain legal and financial things and going on. We, we, we're not a registered charity in India yet, so we have to purchase the orphanage property through Mark's ministry and things like that. There's certain legal things. That's what's blocking it. But um, not blocking it, but impeding it. Um, but that's essentially it. You know, when I see missionaries like Mark, and we have other ones in Moria like that, for Africa and for... Uh, for the Philippines and for Thailand, you know, <laughs> you know that they're people God has called. They're people God has called and given that burden. They're not there of themselves, even of their own initiative or desire. They're there and they're in it for one reason. Jesus told them to do it. And we believe we've reached the time in Moriel where India is something that Jesus has told us to do. So again, your prayers are coveted. Your prayers are much coveted. We don't ask for money. We only ask the Lord for money. But we do ask for prayer. If we get the prayer, we'll get everything else we need. We do ask for prayer. Well, so it is.